We all love time-lapse videos of the stars moving across the sky. But really, we are the ones who are tumbling through the universe on a giant wet rock vehicle called Earth with a windshield called the sky. Many of us have grown up with the idea that Earth revolves around the sun, which stays still in space. But in reality, the big picture is much more complicated and fascinating. As we investigate Earth's delicate dance within our cosmos, we discover that our planet doesn't just orbit the sun, it's hurtling through space at an astonishing pace, and so is our entire solar system. But here's the fascinating part. This motion could be linked to some of the universe's most intriguing mysteries. Scientific theories propose that Earth's journey through the galaxy might expose us to cosmic rays, potentially leading to genetic mutations and playing a role in mass extinctions on our planet. You might have seen those videos showing the planets of our solar system moving in a mesmerizing helix through the universe. But the truth about Earth's motion through space is much more captivating. These videos, while not entirely inaccurate, can be misleading. They sometimes make it seem like the traditional idea of planets orbiting the sun is wrong, suggesting we're on a wild cosmic ride. Astronomers long ago noticed that Mercury, Venus, Mars, and basically all the planets in our solar system orbit in nearly the same flat plane. How did this happen? The answer lies in the way our solar system formed. Planets took shape from a flat, spinning disk of dust that encircled the young sun. This disk dictated the plane in which the planets would eventually orbit. But let's see this in more detail. There are many planetary systems like ours in the universe, with planets orbiting a host star. Our planetary system is named the Solar System because our Sun is named Sol, after the Latin word for Sun, Solus, and anything related to the Sun, we call Solar. If there's one thing we understand about planets, it is that they're all different from each other. But all of them have one thing in common. All planets and exoplanets were born in an environment known as a circumstellar disk, around their host star. How is that possible? Let's start from the beginning. We will use our solar system as an example. Approximately 4.5 billion years ago, a dark cloud of gas and dust began to collapse. As it shrank, the cloud flattened into a swirling disk known as a solar nebula. And according to NASA, a star comes to life when a colossal cloud of gas collapses due to gravity. This cloud, initially on the edge of instability, can start to shrink under the influence of slight disturbances becoming denser and smaller. The trigger for this collapse often comes from external factors, such as a nearby supernova explosion, where a massive dying star releases its materials into space. This event can set the collapsing process in motion, creating new stars from the remnants of old ones. As this cloud shrinks, the heat and energy generated by the collapse counteracts the gravitational pull, reaching a balance. It's at this point that a star is born. These stars are essentially massive, hot balls of gas, and our sun is no exception. What follows is a bit less certain, but what we do know is that a circumstellar disk forms around the star, and material continues to fall inward. This material doesn't fall directly toward the center, but rather spirals around it. This spinning motion gives rise to the sun's rotation and the planet's orbits. It's much like how clothes rotate and gather in a washing machine due to centrifugal force, forming a circular pattern. Billions of years ago, this same principle applied to the material around the sun, causing it to thin into a disk. Within this disk, small bodies known as planetesimals began forming due to collisions. Over time, these aggregations led to the creation of the planets as we know them today. Even now, the major bodies in our solar system follow the same orbital plane, known as the ecliptic. This is the simplest and most elegant way to answer the initial question. Why do planets in the solar system orbit in the same plane? Now that's over with. Let's move on to the interesting astrophysics and talk about how Earth is really moving and what we can learn from that. In the world of Galilean relativity, Defining how the Earth moves can be a bit tricky, but it's essential to choose the right reference frame depending on the task at hand. For instance, when NASA plans a mission to Mars, they don't use Cape Canaveral 
or the Earth's center as their reference points. Instead, they employ an inertial frame of reference within the solar system. However, here's the twist. The Sun isn't sitting still either. It's zipping around the galaxy at a speed of 230 kilometers per s. So, if we want to understand how Earth is truly moving, we need to select the right reference frames. Let's begin with the one we commonly use, where the planets appear to orbit around a relatively stationary Sun. But there's a bit of inaccuracy in this depiction. In reality, the planets exert gravitational forces on the Sun, just as it does on them, causing the Sun to move. To get a more accurate picture, we can look at the motion from the perspective of the Bere Center, which is the center of mass for the entire solar system. From this viewpoint, the Sun performs a complex dance, mainly influenced by the gravitational pulls of massive planets like Jupiter and Saturn. The location of the solar system's barycenter can vary, sometimes even extending beyond the Sun's surface, particularly when these giant planets align in a particular way. So how does this affect Earth's orbit? The barycenter's motion is slower than Earth's orbit. This causes Earth's elliptical orbit to stretch and squish very slightly on the time scale of Jupiter and Saturn's years, 5 and 12 Earth years respectively. The pull of the other planets also causes the orientation of that ellipse to rotate around the Sun over thousands of years. So that's Earth's motion within the solar system. Complicated, but not as complicated as its motion through the galaxy. That galactic motion is also much harder to figure out. In the solar system, there are relatively few bodies whose gravity you need to account for. And anyway, the gravity is massively dominated by the Sun. The source of the Milky Way's gravitational field isn't dominated by one object. Everything orbits in the summed gravitational fields of everything else. That makes things tricky, but it also means we can learn an enormous amount about our galaxy's complex structure just by tracking the motion of its constituents. The solar system is moving at about 230 km slash s relative to the center of the Milky Way, give or take. That means a single orbit takes almost 230 million years. The last time the Earth was on this side of the galaxy, dinosaurs wandered Pangaea and trilobites had just gone extinct. To understand how the Sun moves through our galaxy, we need a different reference frame. The galactic center, though, is tough to pinpoint accurately. So we often describe the Sun's complex journey concerning a simpler reference frame we call the Local Standard of Rest, LSR. Imagine the LSR as the path the Sun would follow if it were on a perfectly circular orbit starting from its current position. This choice makes it easier to describe the non-circular nature of the Sun's actual orbit. There's a sound scientific reason for this. Most stars within the Milky Way disk begin in nearly circular orbits. When stars form, they're nudged into these circular paths due to interactions with other gas clouds, a process called friction. Stars, however, don't experience this friction and remain close to their initial orbits. Over time, though, other gravitational forces in the Milky Way can subtly shift their paths. To determine the Sun's speed concerning the LSR, scientists study young stars that recently formed and are still close to their birth orbits. By averaging their motions relative to us, we've learned that the Sun is moving slightly faster than expected for a perfectly circular orbit. In this LSR reference frame, the Sun exhibits a forward drift of about 5 km per s, moves inward toward the galactic center at approximately 8 km per s, and rises above the galactic disk at about 7 km per s. This small but crucial motion, known as the peculiar motion, significantly influences the journey of the Sun and the entire solar system through our galaxy. For starters, this slow drift toward the galactic center doesn't mean we're going to fall into Sagittarius A. The Sun is trying to execute a slightly elliptical orbit around the galaxy, and currently, it's moving closer to the galactic center. But the Milky Way's mass is spread out through the entire galaxy, rather than concentrated in the center like in the solar system. That means simple elliptical orbits aren't possible. Instead, the Sun traces out this pretty flower pattern over many orbits. Geometrically, it's epicyclic, the shape that a smaller wheel makes when rolling on a bigger wheel. We are currently a few dozen light years above the middle, although it's hard to know exactly where the center of the galactic disk is. We're not in danger of escaping the galaxy. 
With more matter below than above us, the disk's gravity is slowing our upward motion. In a few million years, we'll have clawed our way to around 300 light years above the disk center before our upward motion slows to a halt and we begin to fall back in. We'll plummet through the disk, overshoot and pop out the other side. We execute one of these graceful leaps roughly once every 60 million years, so a few times per galactic orbit. This vertical oscillation is more than just a curiosity. Some astronomers think it could be directly tied to mass extinctions on the Earth. You know the dinosaurs went extinct 60 million years ago. The center of the disk is a more dangerous place for the solar system due to the higher density of stars. It puts us at a bigger risk of a nearby supernova, or close encounters with other massive objects that could destabilize debris in the outer solar system that could impact the Earth. But that's a story for another time. This bouncing motion of the Sun and other stars is also a useful scientific tool. It gives us a way to test different theories of the mysterious dark matter which is invisible and has only been detected by its strong gravitational influence. There are many different models for what type of particle or object dark matter is made up of, and these models make different predictions for how dark matter interacts with itself. In the more mainstream models, it interacts with itself almost not at all, which means it stays very puffy and spread out. However, some dark matter candidates might experience very weak self-interactions, resulting in a force similar to friction and enabling dark matter to accumulate in the disk of the galaxy, which would lead to a more massive disk than the case where dark matter is more spread out. Okay, now we know how the sun moves through the galaxy, but what about the solar system as a whole? The plane of the planet's orbits, also called the ecliptic plane, is tilted by about 60 degrees, that's why we see this sort of squished corkscrew pattern as the planets move through the galaxy. The orbits of the planets cause them to spend half their year ahead of the Sun in the galactic orbit, while they lag behind it during the other half. In the case of the Earth, it's the farthest ahead of the Sun in September, while in March, it's farthest behind. Also, for half the year Earth is moving in the same direction as the Sun through the galaxy, so their velocities add together with the maximum speed in June. In the other half of the year, we're moving backwards relative to the Sun's motion. So in December, Earth's galactic motion is the slowest. Okay, just one more bone to pick about this so-called vortex motion. Currently, the ecliptic is almost face-on compared to our Sun's orbital motion, so the corkscrew is valid. But due to the conservation of angular momentum, the plane of the solar system won't turn with the Sun's orbit. Now that we have a picture of the way our solar system actually moves through the galaxy, one question remains. How do we move through the universe as a whole? As it turns out, the Milky Way is not alone in its travels. Our galaxy is constantly pulled by the gravitational fields of various masses surrounding it. We're currently racing towards the Andromeda Galaxy at the speed of a couple of hundred miles per second. But that's not all. The Milky Way is part of a group of galaxies called the Local Group, which includes more than 54 other galaxies, including our nearest neighbor, the Andromeda Galaxy. The Local Group, along with many other groups and clusters of galaxies, is moving towards a mysterious superdensity in a supercluster of galaxies known as the Great Attractor. The Great Attractor is a region of space about 150 million light-years away and its gravitational attraction is so strong that it influences the motion of galaxies within hundreds of millions of light years. As a result, the local group is pulled towards the Great Attractor at a speed of about 373 miles per second. However, this movement is still not the last of Earth's movement in the universe. During expansion, galaxies move away from one another. The universe is expanding at a rapid rate resulting in a growing distance between galaxies as space itself stretches. It is still possible to determine our speed relative to the rest of the universe using cosmic microwave background radiation. This radiation, which is the residual heat of the Big Bang, permeates the entire universe and is almost uniform in all directions. By measuring tiny variations in this radiation, scientists have determined that Earth and our entire solar system are moving through the universe at about 229 miles per second relative to the cosmic microwave background radiation. At this point, it's no longer a stunning revelation to anyone that Earth is far from stationary 
but rather a tiny but important part of a complex system of celestial movements. The pronounced complexity of the motion of our planet is an impressively complex phenomenon. First, our planet gracefully orbits the radiant sun as it has for billions of years, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. The solar system, of which our planet is a part, also moves through the vast expanses of the Milky Way galaxy, rushing forward at incredible speed and leaving a corkscrew pattern behind it. And that's still not all. The Milky Way is part of a galactic congregation known as the Local Group, which includes a number of nearby galaxies. And together they perform this cosmic dance as they move toward the mysterious gravitational force known as the Great Attractor. This tug of war causes the local group to dash through space at several hundred miles per second. But even that is not the end of the story. The universe itself is expanding, a fact that has been known since Edwin Hubble's groundbreaking discovery in the 1920s. This expansion means the galaxies are moving away from each other at an astonishing rate. So that is how you are currently moving through the universe. It's wildly dizzying in all but the reference frame of your own body. At the most extreme, you are wheeling in a squished corkscrew that shifts to a rolling wheel as it dips above and below the galactic disk, tracing flower petals around the Milky Way, which in turn forms a galaxy-scale helix, the sum total of our wheeling dance across space-time. Meaning that the Earth is not just a rock flying through space, it's part of a grand scheme, a web of cosmic movements both intricate and awe-inspiring. We're just a tiny speck of dust in the vastness of this universe, but the movement of our planet is an integral part of the puzzle that is space. And that concludes this video. If you enjoyed it, leave a like and subscribe to the channel for more content like this. But for now, goodbye, and I'll see you in the next video.